No problem. And uh, so welcome everyone. If you are here, we're happy to have you here. If you're watching the recording, we're happy to have you watch the recording. Uh, my name is Lucy Gray, and I am the founder, the co-founder of um, Global, uh, Global Innovations, uh, Actionable Innovations Global, and the GLOW Conference. Um, I'm going to put up some slides just to kind of lead us through the beginning part of our um, presentation, and then I'm going to turn it over to our guest, uh, Shane O'Connor of the Charter for Compassion. So um, first thing I want to do is thank all of our partners who have made this possible. Um, please go to visit their expo booths today or sometime this weekend if you can. Um, the conference will be, the booths will be open through Sunday morning US times, uh, North American times. So please stop by. Um, leave a comment for them, thank them, uh, ask for more information. Uh, these are all programs and they all have programs and services that can help take your, um, help you globalize your school or help your school innovate. So they've been really supportive of our work and we want to thank them and we hope you stop by their booths. The other thing that I want to mention is um, we are encouraging people to share out their reflections and thoughts on social media using the hashtags GLOWEDU and GlobalEd22. Um, so please follow along the conference happenings on Twitter as long as it still exists. And uh, hopefully that's not gonna happen. Um, and, uh, and share uh, what you learned today. We would really appreciate it. Uh, all these sessions that you're in are recorded. And um, so just so that you can, you know that you can go back and review them. They'll be in the replay section. Oops, and I'm going to remove that so right now. They'll be in the replay section of hop in um, after this session, probably. Sorry, I, my brain is just not working full, full, full speed ahead here. So I want to introduce you to um, Shane. Um, Shane is the colleague of someone who uh, I have found to be very influential in my global education explorations. Um, Shane is from the Charter for Compassion and he works with Marilyn Turkovich who lives in Bainbridge um, Island, Washington, which is two hours earlier than we are um, time-wise. And she enthusiastically <laughs> said, I'm gonna be there when I, I offered her a 6 a.m. keynote, um, Chicago time. And I think she was underestimating how much bandwidth she would have because they had a big gala last week, which as you know, planning these kinds of virtual events is really, really um, taxing. And so Marilyn's not gonna be joining us today, but I wanted to tell the story about Marilyn. Um, Shane had asked me for dirt on Marilyn when we met and <laughs> And I said, she's a saint. And I don't think she would appreciate being called a saint necessarily, but she is one of the most interesting people I've met. Um, I did a, an urban education program at, um, through the Associated Colleges of the Midwest called the ACM Urban Ed Program. And it essentially was a lot of, um, you know, maybe 20 suburbanite rural kids coming from colleges all over the Midwest to do their student teaching in Chicago. And the most, um, she wasn't my direct supervisor. She, she ran the whole program, um, but we had a course in, 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 as part of this called Dimensions of Multiculturalism. And I still have the materials for it. I still think about it all the time. And I still think about how naive <laughs> we were and how much we learned and how kind of just in general, we were just clueless. Um, but fortunately I have evolved and I've always thought of Maryland. I've, I've, I visited Maryland in, in Bainbridge um, um, a few years ago. I've always been impressed by her work and her thoughtfulness and her commitment to social justice. And, and she's a role model for us all. So that's the dirt I have on her, Shane. Um, it's Thank not you. much of a, it's not much of a, of dirt, but I'm going to turn this over to you. Um, my friend, uh, Dr. Bill Rankin is, is also here to help. And um, if you want to discuss anything at the end, we'll be happy to monitor Q and A and that sort of thing. 
but we want to turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Lucy. And I, I hope my audio is working and, and visuals as well. But good morning, Lucy and Bill and all the other folks who are who are either coming in live to this session or you're managing to get it back um, on the recording. So it's, it's good morning or it's good afternoon or it's good evening, depending on, on who I'm addressing this to. It's afternoon here where I am based in Madrid. So it's just turned 1 p.m. Uh, and lots of friends and colleagues in South Asia, for example, it's it's early evening now. So. For, for Marilyn and the rest of the team as well, the, most of our team at the Charter for Compassion, uh, I would say the majority are based in specific times, so it's 4 a.m. for them. Um, so we, they, they and greetings and regards to everybody, but I think they're attempting to listen and, and walk the talk a little bit about compassion, and we'll be exploring this for the next 45 minutes or so here. Maybe some of our definitions, our tools, our ways of working with compassion. Um, but for me, as a, an educator um, and as a father of two young girls, I'm finding out day by day that talking about it, you know, talking about the science, talking about the brilliant evidence that's out there for compassion and kindness is one thing. And, and actually doing it and showing it and modeling um, in order for others to, to mimic, particularly in eyes and voices and souls, that it, it, this is what I'm attempting to do. And for a lot of the time, not getting it right. So. I'm originally from Ireland, as my accent can probably tell, um, but I'm based here in Madrid, in, in Spain, capital of Spain. Um, and as I said, I'm a father, um, I'm a partner, but I'm also um, formerly a global education um, practitioner. Um, and I am, yeah, I'm, I'm from the Republic of Ireland. I've spent a lot of time working in the north of Ireland with young people in conflict. In different NGOs, peace organizations, and human rights organizations, but also just to, to put some, some context on how I got connected to, to an international audience is that I've, I've worked and lived um, and learned overseas in the global south for uh, the best part of two decades now. So mainly in the Middle East, um, living and working in Palestine for, for some time in East Africa, a uh, small bit of time in West Africa, and also in Latin America. So my, my background into global education mostly comes from being on the ground and less of it from an academic point of view, um, although I've uh, challenged myself to go back from time to time. So education for me is very much um, non-formal, informal, and there's there's certainly a space for formal education as well. So there's a couple of questions that I'd love to, to sort of put out there today for anybody watching in. Um, I'm gonna explain a little bit about the Charter for Compassion and hopefully share some of the tools and some of the the ways that the Charter for Compassion that was set up coming up to, to 15 years ago um, as a call for all organizations, all religions, all political groups, communities, and so on, to be more compassionate, to walk the talk of compassion that was coming out of initially um, the concept of the golden rule. So to do to others as you would like done to you, or potentially don't do to others as you wouldn't like others do to you. So that was seen as a common thread between most world religions today, uh, and also, I would say, at the bottom of the heart of many political groups, although walking the talk is not necessarily what we see on a daily basis. So we'll share a little bit about the story, but but more so what we're trying to do now, and, and if we can leave our audience with some tools and some information, but probably more questions, I think that would be um, serving me well. And just to be very honest, in the child's room, it's not a a studio here, um, it's one of my daughter's rooms, is that question even for me this morning before turning up was, is it is it compassionate? Is it the most compassionate in this moment, uh, in this day on a Saturday to actually be here, uh, to be present, to be able to present the Charter for Compassion, um, some of our ideas, some of our connections and networks, um, or is it more compassionate to be somewhere else right now? And I, being, when I say I'm gonna to try to be honest, I don't know if I got the answer to that. Um, we talk a lot about discernment, this concept of wisdom, balance, compassion on one hand, and then maybe wisdom on the other. And you try to make the best decisions, take the best actions, or you know, use the best words in any given moment. Just to contextualize, my one of my daughters was um, was ill for the last few days, ended up in hospital last night, no sleep had by either of her parents, and of course uh, herself and her sister. So is it compassionate? I don't know. I don't know is the answer, but I certainly think it's more compassionate right now for our director to be in bed uh, sleeping away. So 
Um, what I'm going to do is share, a, a, I'm going to get into a video, there's a three minute video clip that we'd like to share just to synopsize and summarize what the, what the charter is attempting uh, aspirationally to do. And thank you, Lucy, if you're ahead of the game here as well. So we might play that and then complement that with some, some conversation and some questions to, to our group and see if we can have as much interaction as we possibly can. Thanks, Lucy, we can play that away. Can you click on it in your window? Yeah, yeah, I was just, just realizing that now myself, so. Okay. And for some reason, of course, Murphy, Murphy's a good friend of mine. Murphy's law always kicks in when we need to do something live like this. Now, here we go. Uh, Murphy doesn't always want to cooperate or collaborate with me. Over the past 10 years, the Charter for Compassion has grown to become the largest network in the global compassionate movement. We have a bold, audacious vision for the next 10 years, where when compassion and action is the path to a world that is, that is peaceful, joyful, joyful, and works, and works for, for all life. We invite you to join the movement and co-create this vision with us. Faced with pervasive, serious crises everywhere, People are awakening and seeking a more harmonious and compassionate world, but without a structure to connect others, grow strong, and take charge of transforming our planet, many are unsure how to proceed. That's where the Charter excels. The Charter for Compassion offers a global structure so that people, organizations, and cities can become visible to each other and make critical connections. These connections happen at several levels. The Charter connects individuals to cutting-edge courses that cultivate empathy and core human values. The Charter connects schools to compassionate learning programs that hundreds of schools and universities are using. Because of the Charter's connections, 22,000 preschoolers in Monterrey, Mexico, are learning about compassion, kindness and empathy through Think Equal lessons. But the Charter is also helping to spread Think Equal and Social, Emotional and Ethical Learning in other countries. The Charter connects cities to other cities that have pledged to focus on open dialogue, understanding and inclusion. More than 400 communities in 54 countries want to increase compassion locally and people at the grassroots level are working on innovative initiatives that address local needs. Let's look at a few examples. Compassionate Pune in India is connecting local farmers growing organic produce to markets that pay them a fair price. Compassionate Pakistan is creating women empowerment zones for skill building. In Belfast, Northern Ireland, volunteers are hosting compassionate cafes to heal political and religious divides. In San Pedro, Mexico, Las Madrinas, the Godmothers, are rebuilding lives, one roof at a time. In Las Vegas, Nevada and 13 other states, 160,000 students are learning science, nutrition and conservation in hands-on school gardens supported by Green Our Planet and community partners. In our role as a global connector, the Charter brings together thousands of partners, supporting organizations and people worldwide so we can learn from each other, share best practices and co-create solutions for the peaceful and compassionate world that we all desire. The Charter for Compassion is sparking a global movement and becoming a powerful engine for planetary transformation. Join us. Compassion is an urgent call to action. Investing in compassion is investing in a better future for ourselves and our next generations. At this critical time in humanity's evolution, please support the Charter's global movement to co-create a world that works for everyone. Thank you very much for that, Lucy. I thought I'd lost myself there, but we're back on. Yeah, 
the chartofforcompassion.org is a website and rather than this being a promotion for, for our organization, um, which is really a network of networks, um, I'd like to maybe just pose some, some questions and, and hopefully ask for, for some feedback as well. Um, so, yes, I'm just making sure that I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that video played. I hope it did. It did for me at least. So if we, if we managed to, to see the three minutes about the charger in a more visual, um, articulate and succinct way, then I'll put in, in three minutes. I hope you got something out of that. And, and some questions might come from that as well. So I say the charger is a network of networks. There's two main um, functions for what we're trying to do. There's two, two main goals or even aspirations. And we talk a lot about having aspirations rather than unrealistic expectations being a compassionate act in itself. So they're not necessarily goals or hopes, but they're aspirations. And it's, it's very much progress, not perfection that we're trying to, to focus on here. So the two, the two aspirations really are to work with grassroots organizations throughout the world, wherever they might be, to address their needs. So to assist and empower others and learn in the process but it's grassroots so it's communities uh, you know on a really global basis um and we've ways of doing that to create our networks and for our networks with other networks around the world so the, one level is very much grassroots working with communities to identify what are those needs and then um coming up with tools using our other partnerships to be able to address some of those needs and the second area is really to focus on education so how we can impact and plug compassion more into education it is within education programs thankfully and um, we're seeing more of it more and more of it every day but within the charter for compassion we have the charter um the uh, the charter institute educational institute sorry the cei char the charter for compassion education institute training and various different topics relating to compassion from compassion science to cit compassion integrity training um, and many, many other trainings that exist around the world, which are being facilitated by the Charter for Compassion, but mostly are facilitated by other groups in other parts of the world. So education is very much a focus and to insert compassion where and when we can within curriculum or curricula. So it could be formal education or non-formal, informal education. So the two strands, grassroots, community connections, and then also education. And I can talk a little bit about how, how we're trying to do, how we're attempting to do that in various different parts of the world. The two sort of takeaways, tools, if you were to click on the website, um, the chartforcompassion.org, the, the co-creators map, and I'm going to try and spend a little bit of time at some point in the next 30 minutes or so, just explaining and navigating. Uh, our people will get it much quicker than I've even got it, but the co-creators map is one way to do that so you can literally sign up as an individual as an organization as an institution as a town or a city and hopefully indeed as, as a nation hopefully soon it's a fairly new addition to the charter for compassion and it was a it was a, a i would call it a, a compassionate act from somebody working the tech world for some time who decided they wanted to put their efforts experience and um expertise into creating a map which is really simple to use that can share links around the world, share themes and projects, um, and share inspiration, what, what's actually happening in different parts of the world. Those that are curious to learn more and those that are already doing it but want to connect with others outside their community um, and, and to, to bounce energy, bounce ideas, and bounce inspiration also. The co-creators map is, is very much something that we'd like to, to show because it's walking the talk. It's not just um, coming up and, and regurgitating science about compassion and um, and talking about these, you know, wonderful things. It's it's an action-based project, and we want people to own that. In fact, as Marilyn, our director, often mentions, there's no ownership to this particular project, the co-creators map. The charter will be happy to give that project away to another organisation that can really utilise it. But for the moment, it's it's containing, it's hosting the co-creators map. And then the other thing that I've been really inspired by recently, that we'd love to share with you, maybe a couple of short examples it, it's a grassroots wisdom book and this is where if there's any creators app creators out there as well that might be watching this or people who know somebody who can create a really quick versatile digital app it's it's using the science of compassion but also using the concept of giving and receiving as quickly as we can knowing that this affects us on a physiological emotional psychological way so 
observing and being part of an, a compassionate act or a kind act of some kind. It's where people can put that forward. Now, at the moment, we have it on our website, um, and you can just click into the website, the chargeforcompassion.org, and go into the um, the this either co-creators map or the grassroots wisdom book, and you can share what what's been happening in your in your community, in your family, in your in your you know wider community. But you can also listen and read and connect with what's been happening in other parts of the world. And then when we know, even on a on a short-term basis, by me reading this morning some of these stories before coming on, I was affecting my nervous system. I was affecting my ability to be able to be more present in any given moment. I was feeling the kindness and compassion from other people in other parts of the world, but I was benefiting. And equally, we know from from thorough amount of research at this point that by sharing our stories, even though they may be quite challenging at times, by sharing our compassionate links, looking at the pro-social, you know, mental within each act of compassion, we're able to also f physically feel like we're connecting with others, but also we can phys physically, psychologically, emotionally benefit in any given moment. So they're the two things, if I could ask us to take take a, a note down, if we're taking any notes, the co-creators map, please sign up. If anybody in the next half an hour has the wherewithal to, to click on the website while you're listening here and sign up You're in, as an individual or an organization or an institution, indeed, um, you can sign up and just connect with other people, maybe in your community that you didn't know were doing certain projects or were interested in certain themes this is an opportunity to do that and and it does excite me because it's it is versatile um if there's any app creators that want to be able to lend a hand to the charge for compassion as a network of networks sharing daily compassionate acts is beneficial for us and others so um yeah we'd love to work with people on that as well so i'll share one or two stories just in the knowledge that it, we know you'll, you'll benefit from hearing these stories as well and they're real with real people based on reality in our world uh, today even three years ago a lot of the content that i would have been sharing is a little outdated so it's trying to keep up with what's going on in the moment so um, i'm going to move on now and i'm just going to pause for a second i'm going to ask you just to take one minute to read this sentence which makes little or no sense to you on a saturday morning or afternoon or evening just read through the sentence and I'll explain the question that I'm looking to, to get some feedback on. Finished files are the result of years of scientific study combined with the experience of many years. Some of the questions that are coming in, thanks for sharing them, Bill. So we'll try to get to some of them as well within the next few minutes. But just now for the moment, what am I trying to get at here? This is a sentence. You may or may not have seen it before. It's just words, just letters. The question for you, just to get the brain working in a slightly different way, how many times, and you can put it in the chat, you can share it if you want. There's, it's no, there's no judgment in the answer to this question, as there shouldn't be judgment to the answers of any questions, but we're not trying to see who's smart and who's not here. This is just, what do you see? So the question is, within this sentence, how many times can you count or see the letter F for football, a controversial topic right now as the controversial World Cup kicks in this weekend. How many times can you count or see the letter F? And we'll leave it up for a few more seconds. And if we get loads of answers flowing in, great. If we get none, that's okay as well. Just how many times can you see the letter F? So I don't think I have access to the, the chat right now, but if you are able to put your answer in chat or just think about it. It might be a ridiculous question. You might say, what's this Irish guy talking about? Beyond compassion, why are we talking about a random sentence here? So if you see in a sentence, two, for example, which is the first answer I ever gave to this particular sentence, two, and I was quite happy and satisfied with that. And then my grandfather, when I was about seven years old, with this sentence that he showed me, he, he, he was much more of an educator than a fixer. He didn't give me the answers. He just said, look again. And I felt a little patronized. And I found three finished files and scientific. And I was happy. I was content. And I would have moved on from there. And, and I got the impression there was more because he said, you know, if, if you're happy with that, that's, that's your answer. 
and then I looked at it again. And my grandfather has since passed on only a few years, but he was a wise man and he taught me many different things. But this is probably one of the strongest lessons he ever taught me that it's it's not necessarily always having the right answer, but knowing that we don't know certain things. We don't know what we don't know. We call this epistemic humility in the area of the science of compassion as well. So finished files are the result of years of scientific study combined with experience of many years. There was more than three. I looked again and I found a little F in the word of, and there was another of, and in fact, there were three ofs. So there are six is the official answer to this question. Now I've taken this little activity and I call it blind spots. There's certain things in this sentence that I wasn't seeing as a young person or a teenager or an adult because I wasn't looking for them. I presumed there were three or two Fs because the sound F was coming out to me three times. I wasn't looking for the of because it sounded like a V and in C, I was challenged by that. This is just a very simple activity, but there's many activities that you probably see on a daily basis, there's many episodes, there's many involvements and situations you find yourselves in where we think we know the answer to the question because it's so simple. It should be right there in front of us, but in fact, we don't always know the answer. And there's about 240,000, the average human has about 240,000 blind spots, schitomas. In some of the training that I deliver, we call these um, cognitive distortions. We call this thinking traps or mental, mental traps that we might have. Now, th there's some of them, and many of them relate to compassion as well. So, you know, should I be with my two daughters and my partner right now that, you know, I've had no sleep for the last few days or presenting something that I'm passionate about? You know, sh was I looking for blind spots? Not necessarily when I decided to come back from the hospital here, but my next interactions, are there blind spots? Are there ways I can be a little more compassionate to, to myself and to those around me? Um, and I will ask us to, to think about blind spots that we have. Think about these cognitive distortions um, when we're looking at things within global education, within active citizenship. And in fact, Sonia has asked a question here about ethical learning, um, ethical uh, integrity. There's lots of words that we can connect with this, but we can, we can certainly explore that, those topics as we, we go through the presentation here. And I'm just looking at my watch. We've got about 20 minutes left. So. Where, where the Charter for Compassion derived originally, and I mentioned Karen Armstrong's name. If I didn't, here's Karen Armstrong's quote as well. She's the, um, the founder of the Charter for Compassion. She appeals to people on a global level, on a global forum like the TED, um, TED Awards that were won by Karen and her extraction of this golden rule to connect beyond religions, beyond ethnicities, beyond nations, um, and look at this concept of compassion not being just an option for us. It's essential for the survival of our species. We are here because of compassion. We are generationally, ancestrally, we have survived because of compassion. And that, that's now being researched and it's been evidenced for some time that compassion is essential for our survival. And so, um, although Karen is, is involved in the background right now of the Charter, she was the person who founded it, and she's still the vision of moving beyond all world religions to focus on our common humanity, the things that bring us together and bond us, rather than the differences, is certainly part of her vision. When we look at things like the practical nature of compassion, and I'm talking a lot about the walking the talk, showing, demonstrating, not just talking it, but we know that it's an acquired, it's a knowledge, it's a skill like dancing or music or sport, and we must practice it diligently every day. So there's no point saying to my two daughters, Lua and Kira, practice kindness, practice kindness. It's, it's really good. It's going to be good for you. It's going to be, I need to show them. I need to demonstrate that in, in every action and word. Now, also being forgiving of yourself is part of compassion as well. So it's, it's not necessarily an easy task, but it seemed to be the most effective demonstrating and showing compassion. Move on. Love and compassion. So we're combining love, we're combining kindness, we're combining all the things that we relate to compassion, like empathy, um, even resilience within there. It's a necessity, not a luxury. And without these things that are real, humanity can survive. So not focusing always on the doom and gloom, but looking at progress, not perfection at every possible 
opportunity that we can. It's a necessity again, is what we're what I'm trying to get to here. And I'd love to know um, from the chat again, if there's any replies, what do you see as compassion? How do you define compassion? Because there isn't the right or a wrong answer. I've worked within organizations with very specific definitions of compassion and the Charter for Compassion will have their own interpretation of compassion. What it means is not necessarily how we interpret it, how we understand it, how we embody it, and how we use it. But what is compassion to you? If you have space to write in the chat of your here life, please do write down your definition for compassion, because we can always learn interpretations of this concept, of this skill and this practice. What is compassion for you today, this Saturday? Um, is it integrating ethical learning? Is it being you know, present with integrity? Is it sitting in the present moment with your values in your speech, thought, actions? In the past, one of the definitions that really I was drawn into, and we're gonna make, we're gonna look at a quote from the person that I never thought I'd be as influenced as I was, even though many had told me this individual is really special and has an energy and has a, a, a vision that one can tap into and learn a lot from and gain a lot from. But the definition of um, the Dalai Lama and then centers like the Charter for Compassion, you know, the Life, uh, the Center for in Compassion, Integrity and Secular Ethics, which I was connected with and still am, they define compassion as a desire or a wish to reduce the suffering of others. A desire or a wish a desire, a motivation, or a wish to reduce the suffering of others. And thank you for putting some um, links here as well. So understanding of human suffering, feeling the person suffering, tolerating uncomfortable feelings, and motivating act or actions to alleviate suffering. So that connects very much with what I'm saying, what I'm hearing and feeling as well. So thank you for putting that in the chat. A wish, desire, or motivation to, redu to reduce suffering of others and reduce the suffering of ourselves um thank you for sharing that re-sharing that again compassion is having feelings about another's suffering so compassion maybe with the definition of empathy here and even empathy we could explore for another hour what's empathy the, the resonance of a feeling i'm feeling what you're feeling in any given moment whether it's beneficial feelings or, or sometimes challenging or suffering i'm feeling with you or also the cognitive the understanding that um, it must be quite difficult to be in that situation. So there's a combination even when we explore empathy. Compassion for some people is um, empathy in action. It's not just the words, but it's an action based, as I've seen somebody make reference to in the chat here. And compassion is so many other things for you and for me, but how do we see it? How do we walk it and feel it and talk it? Um, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. So relating to the others here, relating to the fact that we're interdependent, interconnected beings, we know we are. If we want to be happy, practice compassion. Others to be happy, practice compassion. So it's an internal and an external way of appreciating this joy or happiness. And again, what's happiness, what's joy? We could spend lots of time exploring these, but this image for me is, is joy, is happiness. And if we want it ourselves within our our, our, our our core, we practice compassion, whatever that might be to ourselves. If we want it in our families, our communities, our societies, in our greater interdependent world, we practice it. And then I think for the images, at least, maybe finish on, on this one, that it's, it is a doing thing. It's a verb. Thich Nhat Hanh, who's sadly passed away um, this year, in the past 12 months, um, a Buddhist leader who has lots of wisdom when it comes to the context of what is compassion and how do we show it in the world. And there's so many in your community that I know are doing that as well. And linking people together, showing that we have, we have knowledge, we have understanding, we have our own ability to stop in any given moment, to breathe, to pause, to reflect. Are we doing it all the time? Absolutely not. But we have the ability to be able to do that and bring in this sense of equanimity, this sense of calmness and balance in our life. And we know innately what is a compassion, what is a compassionate act. We know it by feeling it, but we also know it by, by sharing it and, and feeling the, the benefits of, of sharing as well. So um, these are some of the definitions behind 
or the, the concepts behind what the charger is doing as a motivation to reduce the suffering of others. Now, the, the practical nature of any program is that it, it needs to be divided into different um, approaches, tactics, skills, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to share everything about the, the Charter for Compassion in the space that we have here, but it's broken down into sectors. So if you get a chance to look on the website, you'll see that it's a network of networks and we want you, everybody in this room, to be able to become a partner. It's free. It's not a profit-based um, entity or organization. A quote that came to me this morning, when I think about peace, and I, I, I spent some time working with different peace institutions and organizations in the world, um, both in my country where I grew up and in other parts of the world. And although they were inspiring places and doing inspiring things, the amount of burnout the amount of people that knew compassion, wanted to work with compassion, but somehow were distorted like the blind spots in their quest to become compassionate for others and themselves. You know, I've seen, unfortunately, so much bullying, so much burnout, so much mental health uh, challenges by people who wanted to do whatever we you knew to quote, good things, compassionate things, kind things, somehow the world and in all that it has to offer was was challenging uh, me as well as one of these individuals and uh, far from from there yet but, um to be aware of these distortions to be aware of these challenges and to use compassion itself as that tool whatever and however that you might use your your form of compassion but uh, i am aware that the, uh, the concept of peace and the definition i used to use was if we waged for if we waged for peace, what we see as peace, with the same intensity with which we wage for war, there wouldn't be any war. We wage for peace with the same intensity with which we wage for war, there wouldn't be wars. Bringing that back to compassion in this area that I'm working in now and, and sharing um, in terms of the, my role in, within education and the Charter for Compassion, it's a question and I don't have the answer for this, but if we waged for compassion and kindness, how we define these things, I would say to my children, kindness, but maybe compassion is, is what, you know, people of an older age group can get and understand. If we wage for compassion with the same intensity with which we wage for profit, for more, for more again, um, would we have poverty in the world today? Would we have the same destruction, the same gaps between those who have and don't have? Um, I, I believe I have a premise that we wouldn't, but it, it's a question. If, and what does that look like if we were able to wage for compassion with the same or even half of which we wage for profit and gain and sometimes greed? I, it's, it's a question I leave you with this Saturday afternoon, but it's a question that I'm, I'm thinking about as well. So the areas that we look at, we've got arts. We're focusing on arts quite heavily, uh, particularly in the last week or so with the Charter for Compassion Gala, which we're using arts to explore and explain and connect with people on a compassion. Business, how can we be more compassionate within business? Education is the connector that brings many people here to this conference and to these sessions. Environment, um, free floating anxiety out there from the age of five. My daughter is coming back scared with questions about the environment that I don't have the answers for, but collectively do we have the answers for how we can be more compassionate within environmental education, but also within how we treat our environment. Gender partnerships, health, uh, peace, obviously we, we are connected with many peace initiatives in different parts of the world and restorative justice is something separate to that. So looking at justice and peace in, in two different areas. Um, we have RI a program called RISE, which is religious interfaith spirituality for everybody. So it's, uh, you could say they're all one part of one program, but in the Charter for Compassion, there are three peace, restorative justice, and then this RISE program. Science and research, how compassion can be plugged more into science and research. It's there in front of us, it's backing it up. Um, and then social justice as another area to really focus on, to get people um, feeling resilient within that area of social justice, practicing the compassion on themselves so they're not burning out, as I've often done as an activist myself, um, on certain themes and topics, but having the tools to navigate the, the, the areas like social justice. And then finally, social services as well. What do we need to provide? What do we need to receive? How can we pl plug in and link compassion within all of these 12 areas? So we've 
we've broken these down and we want partners in all these areas and that's why i'm sharing them with you right now so you can click on any of these areas um to, to connect and join if you're on the co-creators map the partnership map you'll see that we're able to just click into any of these areas and you'll find out again somebody on the other side of the village might be doing something similar or different that you can collaborate with but if we don't know what's happening it's very it's very challenging to to you know have that connection and make it and so that's what we're we're trying to do um, within the various different areas that we have here so i'm just going to share we've got about 10 minutes left maybe less so please actively compassionate permission to, to lose your bill to just cut me off um at the time because i think that is compassion you've already told me that you've got the 50 minutes as people coming in even though i've got lots to share and i'd love on behalf of the charge of compassion to share more sometimes we have to be compassionate and it's not easy sometimes we make the hard decisions sometimes in my life the most challenging decision i'm making a day is seem to be compassionate but i know that sugar is terrible for our kids in the evening times in particular processed food saying no to, to to that is a compassionate act in my opinion is it the easy act no does it seem like it's the most loving act in the time probably not as well um, and likewise with all the other things that exist out there that are are challenging us sometimes we being compassionate is the toughest thing to do but probably long term the most um effective and um compassionate in, in, a, in a greater scheme of things so there's a couple of stories. I'm not sure if I have the ability to share the stories live right now so you could see them, but maybe just to, to make reference to, they're, they're on within our um, grassroots wisdom book, just stories to maybe leave you with. And if there's questions coming up that we didn't get a chance to answer, I'm also available afterwards. And I'm sure any of our team would love communication if you have specific questions that you think we might be able to, to address and, and connect with. Um, I want the, the, the final thing before Sharon, actually I'm going to integrate it within this next conversation, but in, within the Wisdom book, I believe the first story that we can op open up in terms of topics and things leading to ethical uh, life is, is one of the areas that we look for stories of compassion. And there's an individual who qu remains quite anonymous quite a lot of the time, but he took this concept of the golden rule and he developed it into a, a book, a booklet, that he wants to share with the world. And he calls this concept golden rulism. Um, it's one individual who said he had been wanting to do this for years and years and years, but time caught up and never allowed him. Eventually said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come up with something. I'm gonna put this into the realm and try to get educators, parents, grandparents, and young people alike to, to connect with the golden rule of, you know, do to others as you'd like others to do to you, but adapt that and try and bring it into action giving guidance, giving a, um, almost like a, a, a guide how we can do that. And so for adults, they'll get this concept much better because the, the theory of mind would state that young people, it used to be thought up to three years old, young people can get these concepts of empathy and detaching from the way your mind works. But, but now the research is indicating that's a little older. It's maybe seven or eight and, and even upwards to teenagers. So maybe not using the language of, do to all others directly or indirectly as you would like them to do to you but maybe making that much more youth friendly or child friendly or in fact in terms of golden ruleism they also focus on maybe don't doing to others directly or indirectly what you would not want others to do to you simple message for maybe us if we get it like this but how do we put that into action and so there was a book um, and it's free, it's downloadable on the website as well, on, on the Charter for Compassion website, the Golden Rulism booklet. Um, but one individual said, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna put it out there. And he's continued with a lot of communication with the team as well these days to see how we can together bring this into the education, bring this in through stories, through music, um, through creative methods, into embodied understanding and learning so it's one one you know area of education is to receive the knowledge the next is really to to critically inquire to ask and others and get feedback from people about how that might make a difference but the third way and all three combined would be ideal is embodied, embodied learning embodied practice and so golden rulism in action is something that one individual wanted to share um with the rest of the world and they put it up onto the stories within the grassroots wisdom book um 
the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step and it's for people that are brave enough to say i'm doing this or i know about this that's being done let's share it and so there's some fantastic stories that um, i've been reading through and they're broken into different chapters i just i could i could advise you just to get on and maybe look at some of the chapters there's religion interfaith and spirituality stories that are happening um, in different parts of the world for example one of the stories i came across recently was a story that went back to 2015 in Australia, for example. It's a project set up after a horrific act um, where people lost their lives and open fire shooting took place. And I know that connects with so many people, unfortunately, in so many parts of the world. But after this fatal shooting, a project was set up using chocolate and coffee uh, to bring people to conversation about religious harmony. And there were some really special moments within that story where people reached out to others from the Islamic community living in Australia, for example, to say, you know, I, I am with you, I will travel with you, was actually a hashtag, a hashtag or I will ride with you. Um, conversation started with an individual that was willing to put, put forward this coffee, uh, chocolate and coffee day, and it spread. And that was through social media, but it was also just through local events that were set up with the desire to reduce the suffering of others. Mission, many people would say for compassion. And we've four minutes left before we kick off. Another great example um, of, in terms of education, maybe we finish with education here as well. Um, it's a project called the Any Town, Town Las Vegas. So it comes from Las Vegas. Um, it involves so many different layers of random acts of kindness, positive empowerment for kids. Um, you know, at, at high school where no one eats alone, students feed the school of their communities. Um, so students themselves taking on the role of compassionate actors. And if you get a chance to read the story of any town in Las Vegas, I think you'll be uplifted in the same way. But try to track the sensations in your own body and think about here's the here's the real gem for the wisdom, the grassroots wisdom book. This is stories that can be applicable anywhere. You can take the messages. You don't have to transplant them directly into your own communities, but you can take the ideas you can transform people's lives by taking the ideas of what's been working in other parts of the world. Any Town Las Vegas is focusing on anti-racism, focusing on allyship, focusing on solidarity, but it's really using groundbreaking techniques to challenge discrimination and prejudice and bias within people's minds. Um, it's trying to implore people to, to learn about self-worth through recognition um, of their own abilities, connection with their own identities and cultures and ethnicities and celebrating that and, and looking at so many other ways they can you know promote their coexistence promote their um common humanity and so there's yeah they're, again the reads if you get a chance to read through the stories they're inspiring and i think that's essentially in a nutshell what the charter for compassion is attempting to do not do everything to all people but create a network where you can come through you can share your stories, you can share your acts of, of receiving compassion, but also giving compassion and know that you're benefiting others in other parts of the world. So um, there's there's hundreds more pages of stories that we could go through within environmental programs as well and projects um, like compassionate tree projects in different parts of the world that you just, you, when you see them, you know they're working, you know individuals, were, they were just thoughts that became actions driven by the motivation to, to have an impact in this area of compassion. And I, I have asked myself the question many times over, what's the best way I can use the, whatever space or time or energy I have left and my own lessons from living in, in often conflict situations. And it's definitely through education. It's, a, it's why I'm working in education today. So if you have any ideas, connect please with ourselves and the Compassionate Education Institute, propose your ideas. Um, and, and let's make them work. If we have ideas, they can work together. And much more chance of them happening together than just keeping them isolated as ideas. As our man with the golden rule and an idea behind that, it's now becoming much more than a, a concept. It's, it's a community now. So thank you very much, Lucy, and all, uh, your team as well, Bill, for assisting here. And um, I really hope you have a fantastic conference and um, a great session ahead that follows this session as well so to get in touch please do and um yeah if you're teachers parents educators grandparents whatever you might be in whatever role reach out um 
I am multitasking right now, trying to get speakers into their uh, in their rooms for the next set of sessions. So I apologize if I missed this. But Bill asked, what would you recommend for teachers who want to start teaching for and with compassion for their students? What are the small initial steps um, that that teachers need to take? Yeah, I mean, there's there's hundreds. This is the thing. It can be a minefield. And thank you for the question. Um, Lucy and Bill and whoever asked that question, it really can be a minefield. What I would say in one small I do is click on the map of co-creators here, find a teacher that's doing that same thing in your local area or somewhere else, because then they're, they're doing it. It's, it's, it's a belief that we need to back up the knowledge and the tools. The resources are endless right now. But finding someone that you know can, can lend a hand and advice on what didn't go so well when they're trying to do the same thing can be ah. invaluable. So, um, I would say link up with someone who's who's done it and is doing it. Um, and please, yeah, reach out to us as well. We can share resources. And, there's there's no if, problem with that. And maybe people can meet people through your network and, and that will get like-minded people together. The other thing I'm thinking in relation to that is this conference community is also a place where you can meet like-minded people who might be doing the same kind of thing in terms of their compassion journey. So so, you know, making friends in our chats here or connecting to people on social media so you get to know them better. Um, our com we have a, a community, too, that has, you know, nearly 30,000 um, educators and organizations in it as well. And um, we found through doing this conference in a different iteration years ago that the re relationships are the are the basis of that. Like you have to get to know someone, you have to find your your people, and and then all sorts of things can happen. And it would be really interesting to be part of a group that's specifically focused on on this one thing. Um, it's not one thing, but it's an all encompassing thing. I think. So uh, I hope everybody will take a minute to to join the the, the charter and explore their resources and materials and. Um, think about how you can incorporate it into your classroom. And there's a there's a school network. Is there a particular link for the school network that's related to the charter? If, if you go into the, the schools, I mean, there's, there's so much that's happening right now within schools. There's a, a project that's about to be launched, which is schools collaborating for compassion. And that's linked with the youth collaborating for compassion. So that's that's live. It's happening. I'm involved in that okay. and would love to get more people involved as well. So okay. reach out through, through the network, through the, through the, you know, give us an email and, and we'll get back to you for sure. Okay. Um, I, I'm aware, Lucy, that there was like, one question Sonia asked about ethical learning. In a nutshell, ethical learning for me, uh, as an educator as well, it, that, that tries to work in this area, it's value-based um, education, value-based learning. So exploring what the young people's values are themselves and giving them the space to explore what values are. But how do we teach? How do we walk the talk of, of this, this value in ethics within integrity as well? So exploring all these er areas, but allowing them to do that. And, and really connect with that as well. And it, I, so our own personal growth as educators is just as important as explicitly teaching it because we have to explore and take all of this in and um, be on our own journey in order to model it for students. That's what I, that's the takeaway that I have. Um, and then Kathy Collins has a recommended reading here, Teaching What Matters by Steve Bano. So people might want to look at that resource. Um, it is, I know we know we have, I think we have another uh, group that's going to be on the stage soon. So I do want to um, thank you, Shane, for coming. I know it's been tough with your daughter uh, in the hospital and everything, and I hope she's okay. And send our best to Marilyn. Um, she, we, we'd love to have her wander around the conference when she's awake and meet people. And uh, uh, we appreciate your time and your expertise and um, go get some rest. <laughs> That's all I can say. Thank you so Thanks, much. In, in Irish, we'd say, Gareth Mila Mahigot, a thousand thank yous to you. Um, and to Falterov, you're very welcome, anybody who wants to know more. So thank you, Lucy, and all your team. Uh, well, top of the morning to you. That's about all I can say in <laughs> Irish. So it's, it's um, a start. <laughs> to start right uh, i have a i have a good you, you, you know, speaking of ireland um we had the executive director for the global education network europe who is based in dublin um speak yesterday 
And if you get a chance, his name is Liam Wegemont. And if you get a chance to look at the recordings, I think you would really appreciate his messaging too. I think it, 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 um, relates well to, to what you're doing too. So, um, a fellow Irishman that you might want to connect with down the road. Anyway, um, I want to give people time to get to the next sessions. There's a bunch coming up. I hope the the speakers have arrived. Uh, we're going to go help everybody and we will, uh, see you at the next set of sessions. Thanks everyone for coming.